thank God. What a mare's nest, or more grimly, what a rehearsal. It is only 24 hours since I got Betty's wire, and already the crisis seems curiously far away, like at sea. Once you have doubled the point and got into smooth water, the point doesn't take long to hide below the horizon. And now, your letter. I'm not at all surprised at your feeling flattened rather than joyful. That isn't ingratitude. It's only exhaustion. Weren't there moments even during those terrible days when you glided into a sort of apathy for the same reason the body, bless it, will not continue indefinitely supplying us with the physical media of emotion. Surely there's no difficulty about the prayer in Gethsemane on the ground that if the disciples were asleep, they couldn't have heard it and therefore couldn't have recorded it. The words they did record would hardly have taken three seconds to utter. He was only a stone's throw away. The silence of night was around them and we may be sure he prayed aloud. People did everything aloud in those days. You remember how astonished St. Augustine was some centuries later in a far more sophisticated society to discover that when St. Ambrose was reading to himself, you couldn't hear the words even if you went and stood just beside him. The disciples heard the opening words of the prayer before they went to sleep. They record those opening words as if they were the whole. There's a rather amusing instance of the same thing in Acts 24. The Jews had got down a professional orator called Tertullus to conduct the prosecution of St. Paul. The speech as recorded by St. Luke takes 84 words in the Greek, if I've counted correctly. 84 words are impossibly short for a Greek advocate on a full dress occasion. Presumably then, they are a praise, but of those 80 odd words, 40 are taken up with preliminary compliments to the bench, stuff which, in a praise on that tiny scale, ought not to have come in at all. It is easy to guess what has happened. St. Luke, though an excellent narrator, was no good as a reporter. He starts off by trying to memorize, or to get down, the whole speech verbatim, and he succeeds in reproducing a certain amount of the exordium, the style unmistakable. Only a practicing rhetoric ever talks that way. But he is soon defeated. The whole of the rest of the speech has to be represented by a ludicrously inadequate abstract. But he doesn't tell us what has happened and thus seems to attribute to Tertullus a performance which would have spelled professional ruin. As you say, the problems about prayer which really press upon a man when he is praying for dear life are not the general and philosophical ones. They are those that arise within Christianity itself. At least this is so for you and me. We have long since agreed that if our prayers are granted at all, they are granted from the foundation of the world. God and his acts are not in time. Intercourse between God and man occurs at particular moments for the man, but not for God. If there is, as the very concept of prayer presupposes, an adaptation between the free actions of men in prayer and the course of events, this adaptation is from the beginning inherent in the great single creative act. Our prayers are heard. Don't say have been heard or you are putting God into time not only before we make them but before we are made ourselves. The real problems are different. Is it our faith that prayers or some prayers are real causes but they are not magical causes? They don't, like spells, act directly on nature. They act then on nature through God. This would seem to imply that they act on God. 
But God, we believe, is impassable. All theology would reject the idea of a transaction in which a creature was the agent and God the patient. It is quite useless to try to answer this empirically by producing stories, though you and I could tell strange ones, of striking answers to prayer. We shall be told reasonably enough that post hoc is not propter hoc. The thing we prayed for was going to happen anyway. Our action was irrelevant. Even a fellow creature's action, which fulfills our request, may not be caused by it. He does what we ask, but perhaps he would equally have done so without our asking. Some cynics will tell us that no woman ever married a man because he proposed to her. She always elicits the proposal because she has determined to marry him. In these human instances, we believe, when we do believe, that our request was the cause, or a cause, of the other party's action, because we have, from deep acquaintance, a certain impression of that party's character. Certainly not by applying the scientific procedures, control experiments, etc., for establishing causes. Similarly, we believe, when we do believe, that the relation between our prayer and the event is not a mere coincidence, only because we have a certain idea of God's character. Only faith vouches for the connection. No empirical proof could establish it. Even a miracle, if one occurred, might have been going to happen anyway. Again, in the most intimate human instances, we really feel that the category of cause and effect will not contain what actually happens. In a real proposal, as distinct from one in an old-fashioned novel, is there any agent-patient relation? Which drop on the window pane moves to join the other? Now, I am going to suggest that strictly causal thinking is even more inadequate when applied to the relation between God and man. I don't mean only when we are thinking of prayer, but whenever we are thinking about what happens at the frontier, at the mysterious point of junction and separation, where absolute being utters derivative being, one attempt to define causally what happens there has led to the whole puzzle about grace and free will. You will notice that scripture just sails over the problem. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Pure Pelagianism. But why? For it is God who worketh in you. Pure Augustinianism. It is presumably only our presuppositions that make this appear nonsensical. We profanely assume that divine and human action exclude one another like the actions of two fellow creatures, so that God did this and I did this, cannot both be true of the same act, except in the sense that each contributed a share. In the end, we must admit a two-way traffic at the junction. At first sight, no passive verb in the world would seem to be so utterly passive as to be created. Does it not mean to have been non-entity? Yet, for us rational creatures, to be created also means to be made agents. We have nothing that we have not received, but part of what we have received is the power of being something more than receptacles. We exercise it, no doubt, chiefly by our sins. But they, for my present argument, will do as well as anything else, for God forgives sins. He would not do so if we committed none. Where to serves mercy but to confront the visage of offense? In that sense, the divine action is consequent upon, conditioned by, elicited by, our behavior. Does this mean that we can act upon God? I suppose you could put it that way if you wanted. If you do, then we must interpret his impassibility in a way which admits this, for we know that God forgives much better than we know what impossible means. I would rather say 
that from before all worlds his providential and creative act, for they are all one, takes into account all the situations produced by the acts of his creatures. And if he takes our sins into account, why not our petitions? I see your point, but you must admit that scripture doesn't take the slightest pains to guard the doctrine of divine impassibility. We are constantly represented as exciting the divine wrath or pity, even as grieving God. I know this language is analogical, but when we say that, we must not smuggle in the idea that we can throw the analogy away and, as it were, get in behind it to a purely literal truth. All we can really substitute for the analogical expression is some theological abstraction. And the abstraction's value is almost entirely negative. It warns us against drawing absurd consequences from the analogical expression by prosaic extrapolations. By itself, the abstraction impassable can get us nowhere. It might even suggest something far more misleading than the most naive Old Testament picture of a stormily emotional Jehovah. Either something inert or something which was pure act in such a sense that it could take no account of events within the universe it had created. I suggest two rules for exegetics. One, never take the images literally. Two, when the purport of the images, what they say to our fear and hope and will and affections, seems to conflict with the theological abstractions, trust the purport of the images every time. For our abstract thinking is itself a tissue of analogies, a continual modeling of spiritual reality in legal or chemical or mechanical terms. Are these likely to be more adequate than the sensuous, organic and personal images of scripture, light and darkness, river and well, seed and harvest, master and servant, hen and chickens, father and child. The footprints of the divine are more visible in that rich soil than across rocks or slag heaps. Hence what they now call demythologizing Christianity can easily be remythologizing it and substituting a poorer mythology for a richer. I agree that my deliberately vague expression about our prayers being taken into account is a retreat from Pascal's magnificent dictum. God has instituted prayer so as to confer upon his creatures the dignity of being causes. But Pascal really does suggest a far too explicit agent and patient relation with God as the patient. And I have another ground for preferring my own more modest formula. To think of our prayers as just causes would suggest that the whole importance of petitionary prayer lay in the achievement of the thing asked for. But really, for our spiritual life as a whole, the being taken into account or considered matters more than the being granted. Religious people don't talk about the results of prayer. They talk of its being answered or heard. Someone said, a suitor wants his suit to be heard as well as granted. In suits to God, if they are really religious acts at all and not merely attempts at magic, this is even more so. We can bear to be refused, but not to be ignored. In other words, our faith can survive many refusals if they really are refusals and not mere disregards. The apparent stone will be bred to us if we believe that a father's hand put it into ours in mercy or in justice or even in rebuke. It is hard and bitter, yet it can be chewed and swallowed. But if, having prayed for our heart's desire and got it, we then became convinced that this was a mere accident, the providential designs, which had only some quite different end, just couldn't help throwing out this satisfaction for us as a byproduct, then 
the apparent bread would become a stone, a pretty stone perhaps, or even a precious stone, but not edible to the soul. What we must fight against is Pope's maxim, the first almighty cause. Acts not by partial, but by general laws. The odd thing is that Pope thought, and all who agree with him think, that this philosophical theology is an advance beyond the religion of the child and the savage and the New Testament. It seems to them less naive and anthropomorphic. The real difference, however, is that the anthropomorphism is more subtly hidden and of a far more disastrous type. For the implication is that there exists on the divine level a distinction with which we are very familiar on our own, that between the plan or the main plan and its unintended but unavoidable byproducts, whatever we do, even if it achieves its object, will also scatter round it a spray of consequences which were not its object at all. This is so even in private life. I throw out crumbs for the birds and provide, incidentally, a breakfast for the rats. Much more so in what may be called managerial life. The governing body of the college alters the time of dinner in hall, our object being to let the servants get home earlier. But by doing so, we alter the daily pattern of life for every undergraduate. To some, the new arrangement will be a convenience, to others the reverse. But we had no special favor for the first lot, and no spite against the second. Our arrangement drags these unforeseen and undesired consequences after it. We can't help this. On Pope's view, God has to work in the same way. He has his grand design for the sum of things. Nothing we can say will deflect it. It leaves him little freedom or none for granting or even for deliberately refusing our prayers. The grand design churns out innumerable blessings and curses for individuals. God can't help that. They're all byproducts. I suggest that the distinction between plan and byproducts vanish entirely on the level of omniscience, omnipotence, and perfect goodness. I believe this because even on the human level, it diminishes the higher you go. The better a human plan is made, the fewer unconsidered byproducts it will have, and the more birds it will kill with one stone, the more diverse needs and interests it will meet. The nearer it will come, it can never come very near, to being a plan for each individual. Bad laws make hard cases. But let us go beyond the managerial altogether. Surely a man of genius composing a poem or symphony must be less unlike God than a ruler. But the man of genius has no mere byproducts in his work. Every note or word will be more than a means, more than a consequence. Nothing will be present solely for the sake of other things. If each note or word were conscious, it would say, the maker had me myself in view and chose for me, with the whole force of his genius, exactly the context I required. And it would be right, provided it remembered that every other note or word could say no less. How should the true creator work by general laws? To generalize is to be an idiot, said Blake. Perhaps he went too far. But to generalize is to be a finite mind. Generalities are the lenses with which our intellects have to manage. How should God sully the infinite lucidity of this vision with such makeshifts? One might as well think he had to consult books of reference, or that if he ever considered me individually, he would begin by saying, Gabriel, bring me Mr. Lewis's file. The God of the New Testament, who takes into account the death of every sparrow, is not more but far less anthropomorphic than Pope's. I will not believe in the managerial God and his general laws. 
If there is providence at all, everything is providential and every providence is a special providence. It is an old and pious saying that Christ died not only for man, but for each man, just as much as if each had been the only man there was. Can I not believe the same of this creative act, which, as spread out in time, we call destiny or history? It is for the sake of each human soul. Each is an end, perhaps for each beast. Perhaps even each particle of matter, the night sky suggests that the inanimate also has for God some value we cannot imagine. His ways are not, not there anyway, like ours. If you ask why I believe all this, I can only reply that we are taught both by precept and example to pray, and that prayer would be meaningless in the sort of universe Pope pictured. One of the purposes for which God instituted prayer may have been to bear witness that the course of events is not governed like a state, but created like a work of art to which every being makes its contribution and in prayer a conscious contribution, and in which every being is both an end and a means. And since I have momentarily considered prayer itself as a means, let me hasten to add that it is also an end. The world was made partly that there might be prayer, partly that our prayers for George might be answered. But let's have finished with partly. The great work of art was made for the sake of all it does and is, down to the curve of every wave and the flight of every insect. 